My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence. My goal is to explore the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. In addition to leadership, I like to discuss mental health, PTSD, and overcoming adversity. If you have a favorite episode, I would love to hear about it. Message me through social media or my website, and I will share some free tools to help you achieve your goals. Please like, subscribe, and leave a review. If you haven't purchased your copy of my book, Fireproof, please grab a copy today. Thanks for listening. Today, I'm speaking with Claudia Miller. She is a sought-after career coach for women in tech, and she's helped her clients land fulfilling jobs at a senior level. She also partners with companies and organizations in identifying rising stars within their organizations and providing strategic insights and support in developing a leadership and talent pipeline with a focus on women and women of color. Due to her efforts, she's worked with top Fortune 500 clients, uh, has partnered with World Business Chicago in developing a workforce development strategy in coordination with the City of Chicago's efforts to decrease unemployment rates for persons of color. She's also the creator and host of Roadmap to the Executive Suite podcast. Due to her client's success, she's been featured multiple times in Forbes, MSNBC, Thrive Global, and Business Insider. And Business Insider put her in their top global list of top innovative career coaches. So, Claudia, thank you so much for coming on. Those uh, individuals that listen to the show know uh, that this is one of the topics that I'm really passionate about, and and I'm just really eager to dig in and and talk to an expert. So, thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy to be here, David, especially like you mentioned, um, some of the topics we're going to be discussing. I feel like that it's needed and definitely needs to be discussed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, let's let's start off uh, at the beginning. Where were you born and raised and uh, what was your early life like? I was born in Guatemala and raised in Chicago. So I lived most of my life in Chicago and now I'm living in the Raleigh-Durham area in North Carolina. And I grew up with uh, my mom and my dad and I have three sisters. So that's how we grew up and eventually my parents separated and then I grew up with my stepdad. But, you know, growing up was very interesting because I, you know, my family and I came to the U.S. to visit and I actually came down with a really rare chronic illness that has no cure. Therefore, that's why my family gave up their businesses and everything they had in, back in Guatemala for, for us to stay here just because in the U.S. was the only country that could maintain or manage my illness. There was, there's still no cure, but at least they were able to manage it here. And since then, I'm grateful to be here and now, you know, been educated. I have a master's degree and have done really great things. And I'm grateful to be here in the U.S. just because there's also more opportunities than they would have been in Guatemala. Well, what what set you on the path that you're on now? Um, I mean, the things that you've done are are pretty incredible. And um, I mean, most people that that are in the know know that uh, they're women are underrepresented in leadership positions, you know, all over the globe. But in the United States, you know, a first world country uh, that you know, you would think would be a little more progressive. And uh, there's still just a huge discrepancy. And uh, I'm wondering, is it personal experience that that created this passion in you or, um, you know, something else? Well, my passion really is helping women be in fulfilling roles that allows them and actually gets them paid what the market is paying. So getting, increasing their pay because, my, most of my clients are not in it to get their next promotion or their next job to increase their salary. They want a fulfilling career where they're being challenged and they're feeling valued and appreciated. Now, we still want them to get paid at the level they deserve to be paid. But I know that when you increase the income, you know, it gives women more opportunities and options to do what they want. And it's been proven, stats show that women tend to invest more in their communities as opposed to their male counterparts. And that is where my true passion lies, is helping women lead fulfilling jobs so that way they can get paid more and it provides options to them. 
And I want to make sure that we create um, women in to get paid well, because it also tends to create safer upbringing and opportunities as well. And especially if they want to continue with their careers. Where did you begin uh, with, you know, really your consulting and, and uh, your coaching? Well, it first started for personal reasons. I consider myself to be very ambitious. So I, you know, I did everything by the book. I went to school. I got good grades. I even had a full ride scholarship uh, from Bill and Melinda Gates. I did internships. I volunteered. I mean, I checked off all the boxes and I figured once I graduate from college, I'm just going to be like the interviews will just start pouring in and the opportunities and it'll be my picky. And that did not happen. <laughs> Thankfully, I had one interview and they offered me the job, but that I, that's when I realized that everything even doing by the book isn't going to be enough. I needed to figure out how to navigate the career path, how to get ahead in your career, um, how to how did some of these people get so many interviews and really great job offers and really great companies. So I really did it for personal reasons to figure out how can I get ahead in my career and it took me about three or four years, but I invested heavily on courses, books, um, career coaches, resume writers. I networked with people, especially like on Business Insider, I would say like how this 25 year old, you know, is making over six figures. I would reach out to those people and ask them questions. How do they do it? You know, what was their strategy? And one thing that was in common, which made me feel really great about it was most of them came from humble beginnings. There was nothing really special about them where, you know, they didn't come from an Ivy League degree, um, but it was how they approached the strategy around it and how they went after it. So I focused on the strategy around it and it took me a few years, but then I started getting, you know, multiple salary increases. I started getting handpicked by the CEO to lead special projects, um, to lead a task force that, you know, a lot of them had more years of experience than I had been alive. And that's when I started really realizing what moves the needle ahead, what helps you advance in your careers. And that's when I started helping others. They came to me asking for advice, but a business grew out of it. And that's what I do now full-time in helping women move into more senior leadership roles. And I also work with companies and helping them build the leadership and talent pipeline. So why is it important for more women to move into leadership roles? Well, overall, it's just good for business. Stats show that women who are in leadership positions, they tend to have a higher ROI than businesses that don't have women in leadership roles. Um, it also creates and helps with talent retention. So there are very high performing professionals that are also women, but they're also men allies that want to go into a company where they're seeing women in leadership roles. So what they see that you tend to have a better retention rates because they're able to see a diverse group um, at a very high level. And overall, it also helps with innovative strategies when it comes to a business. When you have a women's perspective at a leadership role, it helps us address maybe some blind spots that the company might have overmissed. It's also over missing a 50% of the population. Some of the products are meant for women um, for the most part. So we want to get their input because that way it helps us or helps the company stay innovative, stay alert, and they might even create new products and services around it by serving the other 50% of the population. This is a, a this is a question that I've asked before, and I, I'd like to get your your insight. Why do women have a hard time advocating for themselves? Well, it depends. It could be from cultural beliefs. For example, I know in the Hispanic community, we're taught you know to be humble. We don't toot our own horn. We're not talking about our achievements. We're taught to just work hard, put our heads down, and eventually we're going to be recognized for our hard work. And that's not necessarily what happens in the corporate world. And not always the best person that's fit for the role gets the job is the person who interviews the best that gets the job. So they are already some cultural or cultural systems around or, or factors that impact that. So women are less likely to, you know, talk about their achievements, talk about what they've done for their department or that specific project. And because they don't talk about it, people don't know about it. There are also reasons why it's hard to advocate for themselves where, you know, it is depending on the company, it could be for whatever reasons, they're just not even given the opportunity. For example, I've had multiple clients where they've worked at the company for 
quite some time. And what comes to mind right now is one of my clients worked at a company for 10 years. She developed a product um, that is now world recognized and is very competitive in the marketplace. She built it from scratch and she was promised a promotion. And for women, we feel like we need to fit 80, 90% of the job description to go after that job. Whereas men, they feel like as long as they fit 50 to 60%, they feel comfortable applying for that job. But she was promised a job, but because she didn't have the manager experience, she was asked to do it for two years. She eventually ended up getting the manager job and come to realize that she was getting paid $50,000 less than her direct reports. And she wasn't even at the bottom of the salary range. So I feel like as women, we are not going after jobs unless we're hundred percent qualified where men feel like, Hey, I, I can, I don't have the experience, but I have the transferable skills, which is the right mindset that you should go after. You don't need to fit 100% of that job description, because if you do, then you're overqualified or you're going to be bored and you're not going to be challenged. And then six months, you're going to be miserable and you're going to be job searching again. So there should, you should not fit 100% of the job description. Um, The other thing is that what I've seen over and over again is that usually men are not told to do the job for two, three years before getting the job and the compensation, whereas expected for women to do it. And you can't be assertive because all of a sudden we're seen as, oh, she's, you know, she's being pushy or, or, you know, I hope they don't say this, but like, oh, maybe it's the time of the month where when a man is assertive, they're leaders. So there's always these standards that men can do, but women can't do. And we're dinged because of it. And we get, you know, it goes against us and then we don't get promoted. And I believe that one, we need to take charge of our career. I know whatever it is, as, like I said, I'm from a Hispanic culture. So I learned to speak up for myself. I learned how to advocate for myself and talk about my achievements. That's still true to my personality, but because that is needed as well. So I need to advocate for myself, but I also need the company support. And if a company's not there to support me systemically and there aren't mentors and advocates, then I go elsewhere or I start building those mentorships and advocates within the organization. So I do feel like it's a two-prong approach where as an individual, we have this responsibility, but also companies need to have this responsibility in creating a system that allows us to thrive in. Can, can you talk a little bit about some successful systems that have been implemented that, you know, empower women and really elevate them into leadership roles? Yeah, well, some companies, what they've done or they've been doing is they're having a salary audit, figuring out, you know, are they paying their employees equally as they should? And I understand maybe some candidates have higher education or specific certifications, but there should not be a person that's getting paid 50% less for the same amount of work that they're producing. You know, and as we look into, you know, women, especially after COVID, the salaries have been grossly impacted where women used to get paid 82 cents on the dollar, but since COVID it dropped down to back to like 74, 75 cents on the dollar. And when we start looking down into women and women of color, for, for example, for Latina professionals, they get paid 56 cents on the dollar, meaning it would take a Hispanic woman two years to make the same salary that our white male counterparts earn in one year, while they're still producing the same amount of work. Now, I understand that there's a small discrepancy based on, you know, certifications that they have or specific degrees, but there should not be a person making 50000 and another $100,000 for the same amount of work and responsibility. So like, that's where I see a lot of discrepancies happening and, you know, where we need to move forward towards companies that audit our salaries and realizing this person is not even at the lower end of the salary range, which unfortunately, a lot of my clients that find themselves afterwards realizing that they're not even getting paid the bare minimum of what they should have been. And the other thing is really is understanding, like, do we have women leaders how is our leadership group look like? And if it's not diverse, how can we create systems? How can we mold and really develop in our employees to help them move up the career ladder? Most times companies rather hire externally than internally when companies have the talent internally. And if you don't have the talent, how can you create a system within your organization, start building your talent? Because your employees have a lot of knowledge and experience that you need to invest in because 
if you were to bring someone externally, it's going to take you six to nine months for that person to get up to speed based on your company, your procedures, your processes and networks and all of that. Whereas an internal employee already has that information. Why not build them up? Especially right now, every single day, I was reading a stat that every single day, over 100,000 100, boomers um, leave the workforce and HR people are scrambling to fill in those leadership positions. But because they haven't created a leadership and talent development pipeline, they can't fill those roles even fast enough. One of the things that you do as a coach is you help develop women and you help them develop a strategy to, you know, advocate for themselves and get the knowledge, skills, and abilities to, you know, become upwardly mobile, um, or maybe even just to recognize what they already have and go for it. Speaking, okay, one of the things that I, I read in, well, I just did it when I uh, introduced you, but you, you've worked for the city of Chicago and I, I'm really curious about the the successes and failures that you saw while working with the city of Chicago, and what are some lessons learned through through those successes and failures that um, maybe help you better solve problems for other organizations? Well, I like the fact that one city of Chicago, they realized that I think their unemployment rate at the time was around 11 to 12, 11 to 12 percent unemployment rate. But when they dove into the numbers, over 20, 30 percent of the unemployment rate was coming from African-American and Hispanic Latino markets. And it was because, you know, for various reasons. So they realized, yes, it's 11, 12 percent. But if we really want to move the needle down and really decrease unemployment rates, who are the biggest communities being impacted? So they noticed that it was partially the Hispanic population. And then that's when they brought me in to create and figure out how can we educate them on the resources? How can we best support them? And especially with COVID happening, I mean, a lot of people lost their jobs and um, some of them had to figure out new skill sets because you know a lot of these companies were just shutting down and being impacted. So that's when really we started realizing, well, we need to first communicate the resources that are available to them. Maybe they need to sharpen the skill set. Um, how can we create more opportunities for them? Um, how can we bring in more resources within the communities that helps them navigate the space, um, be able to apply to jobs in a very competitive marketplace? I mean, there was a lot of people leaving their jobs or getting laid off um, or plus the great resignation. So it's how can we create these strategies to really help them and develop them. And that's really what helped me and understanding too is based on that work, I also started realizing working with companies to say, well, we're looking at the numbers, but who are the biggest populations being impacted? And what resources do we have available that we can help promote and navigate? And is our system impacting the outcome? So an example is a company created a they changer system that they're no longer going to give you promotions. If you want a promotion, you got to ask for it and you got to submit this paperwork and there's business case. Well, there are people that are just not going to be able to do that. One introverts, they're not going to say like, Hey, you know, give me a promotion. I'm the one that deserves it. There's only five spots available. So give it to me right there. You're already excluding a special population introverts. And now you're, it's very more accessible for extroverts. Now you need to provide a system that allows an employee, whether they're an introvert or not, who is high performing to be promoted and wants to continue moving in their career. So this system overall hinders a special population and not just women. Also, there's men that are introverts, um, but like these types of systems can make a really big impact into companies, their employees, the retention. And then, of course, they started seeing a lot of employees just leaving the organization um, because they had a system that didn't suit a lot of the population within it. They'd rather just go into an organization and say, I'd rather work and together create a you know, strategy with my manager and then build those skill sets to help me get promoted and not, you know, almost like hunger games of there's five promotions, whoever creates the biggest business case around it gets that promotion. And it's not more of like who's more deserving or who's the most qualified. I mean, it really caught my attention when you referenced introverts and, you know, and if we're, 
how does that apply when you're talking about promoting into leadership positions? Because, I mean, it's going to be more difficult for an introvert to lead a team of people when you need some really good people skills to lead effectively. So when it comes to leadership, there are introverts who you can still be a great leader, whether you're an introvert or not. Introvert just says that, you know, when you're among a lot of people, you tend to get drained and you need time to recover. That doesn't mean that you can lead people. And everyone has different styles. You don't have to be the loudest in the room to become a leader. Yeah. Um, so especially with my clients, they're in tech. Tech usually, for the most part, a lot of them tend to be on the introverted side, whether it's a man or a woman, they tend to lead. But we want to focus on what's most important. Can they think and work with the rest of the a leadership team? What is the strategy around it? And even then, like, it's really understanding what is your leadership style, knowing when it's time to vocalize and talk about what you want to bring to the table and bring in your expertise. But you don't have to be the one that's, you know, the loudest and throwing parties every single time for your department because you're being hired to be, to be a leader and lead a team specifically in an area you have a lot of expertise in. So when I work with my clients, it's more of understanding of how can we address it? This is almost addressing the, the issue. And that's where a lot of my clients are. You know, they want to be problem solvers. They have a lot of expertise. And that's what we focus on as opposed to saying, hey, you're going to be Miss Popular today out of all the leadership team. And that is not the goal. We focus on results and how can we create the strategies to help meet business objectives with quantifiable results and then how can we plan for those things that may come up that might create any obstacles or challenges i'd like to shift a, a little bit over to your podcast and um how, how long have you been doing your podcast and and really what was your inspiration behind starting it i've been doing my podcast now for about a year and a half and the reason i started it is because i mean growing up um you know, I grew up from very humble beginnings. I didn't have anyone like in the corporate world that I can look up to or I can ask questions. So there was always these stipulations or thoughts of what it looked like being a leader. And after working with clients, a lot of them, they will tell me I'm very driven, but I just don't want to be in the executive suite because that means I won't have, to, I won't be able to spend time with my family. I'm going to have to give up so much. And when I did work with women that are in executive suite, they didn't have any bigger problems than my other clients who were in director positions. And some of them were very particular when it came to what type of companies they worked for. They worked for organizations that respected their family time. I understand you have to log off at 3 p.m. to pick up your child, um, but you might log on back at 7 p.m. and continue working. They were flexible in the way they allowed my leader or my client to work in. So you can find these different things. And just because you're in the C-suite doesn't mean, you know, that you're sometimes working in less. Sometimes my director clients see their kids even less than some of my executive clients. But again, it comes with one, the organization you're in, two, the boundaries you're set, and three, the type of work. If we know there's gonna be a job that requires you to travel a lot, never be home, well then that's a decision to make because maybe we wanna pivot a little bit and go to this executive role that allows you to stay home, be able to be on, be, spend time with your family. And then if you have to, you can log on later in the evening or log in very early in the morning, depending on your style. So I created the podcast to one, um, actually address these myths that women have when it comes to women in the executive suite, and then how to create a route there. There's not, there's very few women in executive roles. So I wanted to amplify that to say, hey, here's really what it looks like being an executive suite. Here are the goods, here's the bad, and here's the strategy to get there. And here's how to be very intentional and make yourself be successful when you do come to an executive role. How often do you release episodes? Weekly basis. So they get released on Thursdays. And, and okay. So for everybody listening, it's roadmap to the executive suite with Claudia T. Miller. So I will have a link to that in the show notes, but uh, one thing, when you look back at uh, your your interviews that you've done does any of them or do any of the episodes that you've done any of the interviews that you've done stand out to you as being uh you know more impactful 
what's a good episode for people to start off with? My most watched or listened episode has been um, around negotiation, but I feel like the one that they really need to listen is with my interview um, with an executive and her name is Bernice. And what I found profound, and I love that she mentioned this, is she's an executive and I asked her, what surprises you the most now, now that you're a leader in hiring? And she said, what's most surprising to me is that how many few people negotiate, and especially women. I have set budget. I usually go for like the mid range of that budget in anticipation that they're going to negotiate and I still stay within my budget. But very few people actually negotiate salary. So they, I just give them what they ask for, but I still had room for more. So that kind of shows to the job seekers out there to say, salary negotiation is expected. It's just part of the process. Just like you signing your W-4 form or, you know, signing that contract or that job offer, salary negotiation is just an expectation when it comes to that process. So don't be timid or shy about it. And if you're worried that your job offer will be pulled back, well, one, um, I have rarely seen that case and I have no client that has ever experienced that. Now, I'm not saying that's not, doesn't happen. But two, if they pull back the offer because you negotiated your salary, that is a red flag for a company. Run away as far as possible from them because what's going to happen when you ask for PTO? What's going to happen when you ask for maternity or paternity leave? Or, you know, if you need FMLA or something, if they have that strict rigid guidelines where you negotiate and I pull back the offer, just imagine what the culture is going to be like in there. I'd rather my clients stay away from that company and continue job searching and finding the right opportunity, not just any opportunity. Do you have any uh, advice for women that are, you know, in in career fields that are, you know, male dominated? I mean, I I know that you specialize in tech, uh, which is a male dominated field. Um, But do you have any advice for women that are seeking career, uh, you know, a career path into some of these fields, um, you know, to prepare them for that environment? Well, I would definitely recommend for them to find a mentor that is a woman, if they are a woman, you want to find a mentor that someone looks similar to you. So that way they can understand your experiences, but also there are a few years ahead, because there's just so much that I can prep you for that specific industry and I just can't embody everything, but the mentor is really going to help you. And you can have a mentor, let's just say entry level, that is a manager and also have a manager, uh, a mentor that may be a director and another one that may be a senior director. So that way you can start developing the skills that you need to, to be successful in a very male dominated industry. Then also they can help you in honing in your skill set and your craft what I always recommend clients is to identify what are the three hardest skills to hire for when it comes to the specific role or industry. Once we identify what those three hardest skills are is one, assess, do we have it? And if two, we don't have it, how can we get it quickly? Is there a quick certification? Can we mentor someone? Can we do like a shadowing or, or something to get us up to speed to that? And then once we identify the three hardest skills to hire for, that's when you start branding yourself and doing that personal development and branding. That means your resume, your cover letter, your LinkedIn profile. And then, you know, if you're job seeking or job searching at the time, that's what you want to highlight during the interviewing process, because that's what makes my clients stand out from the competition. They become sought after candidates. My clients get offered the top end of the salary range or above it. I have clients that one of them went from making 180000 to getting a job offer for 320, 320000 So again, Don't always feel like you have to fit the job description. Two, find mentors to help you get there. Three, audit and assess your background and expertise. And while you don't have it, start filling in that or work your way through your career and filling those gaps. So what by the time you're ready to get promoted, you've acquired and done all the skill sets and work that is needed to be successful and pivot into the next step in your career. I'd like to shift a little bit because I know you know, that there are listeners that are in, uh, you know, military or uh, public safety occupations um, that are traditionally male. 
male dominant and they're also the the cultures are somewhat competitive and in my experience i've seen that uh, when younger women come into an organization where the more senior women are very few and far between the younger women are are seen more as a threat than uh you know a, a teammate um do you have any advice for that or would you suggest that they steer to a different organization if they encounter that i would ne never steer a woman from any organization uh, they could always be the first so if that is the case, maybe there isn't someone or that person feels friend. Well, you can always find a mentor in other areas. And with LinkedIn and social media, it's so easy to be able to connect with someone. It could also be someone that retired. Maybe it's a woman that retired from that type of industry and reaching out to them. You know, what was, you know, what led them to succeed? What should they start working on? How do they deal with these situations that they may come across? Um, but even looking at other different type of industries that may be similar. So maybe there isn't a fire woman or firefighter that's a woman um, within your specific area, but maybe you can look at a police officer that's a woman that is in a very male dominated industry. It's very um, uh, like, I mean, you putting yourselves at risk and there's just so many things that it tends to be similar in nature when it comes to that. So that could be different areas that you could start looking into. Maybe a woman that is a veteran and you know, asking them, how do they navigate these spaces? How are they able to move up in their career ladder? Doesn't always have to stay within your industry, but we can also expand to different locations. So there's always going to be someone, like I said, it may not be in that industry specific, but we can look at very similar or parallel industries that we can still look up to and then find that mentorship around it. And you can still find a mentor. Like I said, there's men there there are allies that are really great that do want to help and asking them you know what are some of those skill sets i should be focusing on how do you deal with those situations um, and try to be able to understand like how can you pivot that in a way that you can be able to deal with that situation in your personality style really they don't need to find a mentor within the organization that they work for just somebody within that industry or a like industry yeah, when I, my background is in, one of the industries I worked in is in healthcare, and I didn't have a lot of people that within my organization. So I networked with people in California, in New Jersey, and they were really great mentors. They even offered me jobs. Um, I was not looking to relocate or move, but they were really great mentors, and they were not within my city location. Sometimes we do have to expand a little bit more in order for us to be able to tap into that type of resource. Oh, that's great advice i mean and and i think that that's overlooked i think it's mainly overlooked like th there's a lot of opportunities there there's yeah especially i mean like i said you could even reach out to people that retired or veterans and whatever that is like there is a huge network and connection that we could tap into and one thing i realized you don't have to do everything by yourself but you do have to go and look for it so you do have to go and look for that mentor. You have to look for someone that can help you um, get ahead in your career. If you are tend to be more on the sh shy, timid side, try to find a mentor that is still considered an introvert, but is still successful. How are they able to navigate their career space? How do they get ahead? What is their personality style that it doesn't drain them, but they can still come across and be leaders where they're at? Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you feel is important to, to leave with the listeners? Another thing maybe um, kind of based on the questions you brought up is sometimes we think that we have to be the expert in order to be able to do the role. And that's never the case. Um, every skill set out there can be learned. There is an immense amount of resources. And my best practice for me that I used through my career where I applied to jobs where I was 30% qualified. <laughs> I didn't, ex I didn't expect or wasn't waiting for the 80, 90%. If it was 20, 30%, I qualified for the job. I went ahead and applied for it. And I got my 30K salary increase. So the strategy around it is one, figure out what are the true pain points when it comes to that role. So for example, one of my um, roles that I worked in, they were looking for someone with a nursing degree and clinical experience. I do not have either, <laughs> but I already had done my research. I understood that 
the biggest pain points they had is they were looking to improve their patient experience. And I asked them, you know, do I have your support in moving forward to next steps? And they said, Claudia, you're great, but you don't have a clinical background and you don't have a nursing degree. We're looking for someone with that expertise. And again, because after preparation is key here, because I already knew that was going to be their challenge, I can already anticipate it. And I knew the hardest skills to hire for was to be able to solve these issues. I re- responded back and said, well, based on what we've discussed today, your biggest goal here is to help improve patient experience. Because I don't have a clinical degree, I can give you the patient perspective. If I can't understand it, our patients will not be able to understand it. And if I had a clinical degree, it would create blind spots for me because I have been so immersed into this clinical type of environment. Let me help you improve your patient experience from a patient perspective. And then we can identify along with my background in process improvement. And I am Lean Six Sigma certified that I can help you improve these processes to help you meet your objective. Preparation is key. Again, I was able to do that and I knew what the hardest skills to hire for was. Like I said, I did not have any of that experience in there, but best way, like best practice to be great at your job, even though you have no experience in is lean on that network. So what I did is, like I mentioned, there was, this was a new role and it wasn't really existing at that company yet. So I landed a job. I went on that on LinkedIn. I networked with like five, six other people who had three, five years of experience at other um, hospitals um, across the U.S. And I reached out to them and I asked them, you know, what is the low hanging fruit that you've seen? What has been the biggest impact? Um, what has been your biggest achievement to date? And how did you identify that? And then I just replicated, replicated it and did it in my own institution. And I was able to get really great results. And that's how I got handpicked by the CEO to lead the task force for the entire hospital. But again, you don't have to be the expert. You lean on the experts and then you make it your own strategy in your organization and you continue propelling moving forward. Fantastic. Some incredible advice and really thank you for your time and and your wisdom and and for sharing with the audience. Uh, This has been great. This is extremely informative and I feel very empowering. So thank you very much, Claudia. I really appreciate it. And for those listening that would like to employ your services or, you know, just learn more about you to listen to your podcast, if if that's like, you know, the bare minimum that they're going to do, you know, listen to your podcast. But, you know, for those that are listening that want to connect with you, what's the best place for them to find you? They can find me at ClaudiaTMiller.com or they can follow me on LinkedIn. I share a lot of free career advice for anyone. I specialize, most of my clients are women in tech. I do take on some male clients and my some of my other clients are in other industries, but um, on LinkedIn, it's Claudia T. Miller and I share a lot of free career advice and resources. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been just incredible talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review.